The New York Knicks season is saved. Probably. Julius Randle, according to reports, will be out weeks, not months. The long shot championship hopes are still alive. The hopes of a really fun ending to this season. I would say more than alive. They're they're bumping right now. We'll have it for you next on Locked on Knicks. You are Locked on Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, and the season isn't over yet. Julius Randle appears to be A-OK, or relatively so. But before we get into that, I want to thank you for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day. I am Gavin Shaw. And I wanted to uh, remind you, if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe and hit that notifications bell so you never, ever miss an episode. And uh, be sure to do the same on your favorite audio podcast platform of choice to ensure you never miss an episode there. If you don't like looking at our faces each and every day, um, but who's talking to him? Gavin Shaw. I've covered the NBA for the last decade uh, for some of it as a credentialed member of the media. I'm rolling solo today. Uh, to take you into some positive news on Julius Randle. Um, the reports dropped about two and a half hours ago. Um, and the first one uh, from Adrian Wojnarowski, ESPN story on Julius Randle expected to be out weeks, not months, with a dislocated shoulder. Um, you pretty much get it from the headline. Um, the, what they found on the MRI was not particularly severe. Um, compared to what it could have been with a dislocated shoulder. And as we told you on yesterday's podcast, which was the, the pessimistic podcast, is the optimistic podcast, um, a torn labrum would have had Julius out for the entirety of the season. Um, if he's expected to miss weeks, that means he is most likely expected not to need surgery in any form. Ian Begley's tweet was a little bit more cautious, noting there's nothing inclusive yet regarding Julius Randle's timetable. Per league source, source said Randle will be out at least a few weeks, which was obvious given shoulder dislocation surgery hasn't been ruled out, but testing to date has led to some optimism it can be avoided. At Woj pin reports, there's optimism that Julius Randle's timetable will be weeks, not months, yada, yada, yada. So what all this essentially means is uh, Julius, he got his x-ray done. Nothing showed up on the x-ray, which essentially just meant that he didn't uh, break his collarbone, but then you got the MRI. And in all likelihood, his labrum was mostly intact to the point that rehab should be enough for it to heal on its own without um, any adjacent surgery um, that, again, likely would have put him out for the entirety of the rest of the season. It was also reported that on Sunday they did additional tests, so that might have been um, something along the lines of a CAT scan, which which could have given um, even more insight into the specific nature of his injury. All this adds up to a general feeling of uh, we're not going to lose our guy. And I don't want to totally belabor the point because we went pretty in-depth on it yesterday, but it, it's safe to say that Julius being out would have been a death knell to this team. They're just incredibly reliant on his ability to create open shots um, for everyone. And I think that was readily apparent in last night's game. He has made... I would say pretty substantial jumps this year in terms of his ability to stay on schedule against a double team. And I mean that in both senses and that he's not going too quickly and just chucking the ball away, but he's also not waiting, 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 waiting for Reggie Bullock to race around three screens and, and be open for a shot clock beating shot. He's, he's making the right pass at the right time. And I, it, it just sort of feels like the game has slowed down for him. And combined with that, I, I think physically, um, obviously, injury aside, he's never really been in a better place in his career, and he's never been better at leveraging his physical gifts and recognizing, I have a mismatch, and I am not going to concede that by taking a step back long two or a contested three, when I might be decent at those things, but I am elite at putting my shoulder down and getting all the way to the rim. I am elite at backing someone down who's my size and, and turning over either shoulder and hitting a fadeaway. I'm elite at waiting for two or three defenders to converge. And, and then at the exact right moment, pivoting through it and slinging a cross court pass with velocity on a dime to one of the Knicks, many talented shooters. There is an 
inherent awareness to his game. And, and that even if the statistics are pretty similar to what they've been in the past, I, I think is separating him as a player this year um, from what we've gotten from him in the past. And look, it's easy to take Julius for granted because we've had long stretches where things have been awful with him, right? I mean, first four or five games of the season, like I was, I never really thought I'd be on the trade Julius Randle bandwagon again. And I wasn't there because I just, I didn't, there was, it, it was kind of almost where I was at, even when he's playing well, like there was just no world where the Knicks got better where they got closer to winning a title, like trading Julius at the nadir of his value. And, and I think over the summer I was in that same place, but my point is like, I've, I've been extremely low on him. We've all, even like I would say his most ardent defenders at some point have been pretty darn low on him. You still get comments saying like, oh, great. Like, we'll finally get to see what this team is like without Julius Randle holding them back. I don't know if those are tongue in cheek. I don't know if those are other fans commenting on our page. The point is you still get those comments. And it all adds up to an underappreciation of what Randle does. And that is night to night production that is matched by, I don't know, 10 guys in the NBA. And the consistency, I think, is the biggest thing that we've taken for granted. The fact that since becoming a Nick, um, I, I'm so sorry if I'm butchering this, but I, I saw the stat a few days ago in uh, Jonathan Macri's excellent Nick's Film School newsletter. Um, he's, he's played the most games of any player in the NBA outside of Mikhail Bridges, who hasn't missed a single game in that stretch. Like he is the most available superstar in basketball. Um, and and this was a knock to that. And this was almost a major knock to that, that. For my money, if he had been out for the year and if like in the unlikely scenario, like he suffers a setback and he is still out for the year, if I'm the New York Knicks, I am, I'm not packing it in in the sense that I'm not going to be competitive and and we're not going to play hard every night and we're not going to try to win every single night, but I'm packing it in the sense that I am not um, giving up major assets for this year. And I, in, in some ways, I actually don't think it will change their thinking dramatically whether Julius is or isn't out because the Knicks were never going to give up assets this year that would hurt them in a future superstar trade. Um, I was trying to think of the right way to phrase that last night. To me, that is ultimately the cleanest way to phrase it um, now. Like they were not going to sabotage their efforts to get Joel Embiid, their efforts to get someone who's uh, clearly not available right now, but you never know in, in Devin Booker or Luka Doncic, and I am just, I'm throwing names out there right now. Not to say outside of Embiid, these guys are even within the realm of possibility. The point is that Leon Rose has long-term aspirations, and the Knicks, this is also a great point in Macri's newsletter, um, the Knicks have, um, in all their moves under Leon Rose, thought about the short-term and thought about the long-term. They have dealt responsibly, and that doesn't mean every move they make is right. It just means they are considered and measured and well thought out. and. I think no matter how well they're playing, and right now they're playing over these last 12 games, I mean, neck and neck with the Cleveland Cavaliers for the best team in the NBA in that stretch. Um, the Cavs somehow actually have a better net rating, which is insane. But this is a team that is, um, what? let me let me get the number. It's, it's right next to me. Um, they're plus 15.1 net rating um, since the OG Ananobi trade, over 14 games. The Cavs are plus 16.2 um, in that stretch, but they've done it over only 11 games. And yes, the Knicks have had some built-in advantages. The majority of those games have been at home. Um, they have mostly played bad teams. I think they played something like the 18th toughest schedule in the NBA um, over that stretch. And yet that dominance is, is representative of what you would see from a legitimate championship contender. And, and Julius getting hurt would have ended those hopes. It's as simple as that. They could have made a move. They could have gotten someone. They could have gotten someone really, really good. And it was... It wasn't going to put them in the same echelon because Julius Randles, uh, for better or worse, do not grow on trees. He is a borderline unique player in the NBA with the breadth of skills that he brings to the table, with his physicality, with his with his sheer talent. And I think I think honestly, what we've seen recently with his effort, and and maybe it's something we don't appreciate because there are those moments that make you want to. Uh, rip your hair out that I have all the time where he's not running back on defense or he's not paying attention or he's being a crummy teammate, but the, the sheer grit this guy has. And when you, when, when you see him in pain, you know, he's actually hurt because he's played through so much for the Knicks, sometimes to his own detriment and sometimes to the team's detriment, but he is always there. And if, if the RJ Barrett and Emmanuel quickly trade made anything readily apparent, it is that he is beloved um, on this team. And I think 
um, just for him as a human being and for this organization that is clearly in, in such a good place in terms of their connectivity, their love for one another, and it's translating on the court in, in this experience that is borderline transcendental for those of us who have suffered over the last 20 or so years. Um, it's all, it's all amazing. Um, and you just, you just have to be, I think, um, before I get further to any basketball analysis, just incredibly happy for Julius, um, that he's going to be all right, because it would have been a cruel twist of fate for a guy who's, uh, if you remember his first ever NBA season was, was ended, uh, 14 minutes in with a broken leg for him to, to miss that. And then to, to miss out on, um, the best team he's ever played on the best he's ever played like smack dab in the middle of his prime. Um, that would have been cruel and unusual. And if, if this, if it ends up and we can, we'll, we'll talk about this as we go. If it ends up with him missing 14, 15 games, that's okay. The Knicks can absolutely survive that. Um, the important thing is that he's not done for the season. Um, so we will get into um, so much more, um, including uh, where the Knicks rank in terms of title contenders. And I see we have um, a couple of comments piling up. I will address all of those. Uh, but first, I wanted to tell you guys about our good friends over at eBay Motors. All right, guys, passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors is everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. And then we had to tell you about our newest sponsor here at Locked On. This episode of Locked On Knicks is brought to you by Quiz. Today we're going to have some fun and test your Knicks knowledge. So who is the all-time, you know this one if you listen to last week's episode, who is uh, the all-time single game leader in points for the Knicks? Is it uh, A, Richie Guerin, B, Patrick Ewing, C, Bernard King, or D, Carmelo Anthony? Quiz with three eyes is the next generation trivia experience. It's also the world's first platform where you can earn money playing knowledge games. And for Locked On Knicks fans, they've created an NBA quiz game where you can test your knowledge and win real cash. I've done it. I've won. It's pretty sweet. Our friend Darian over at Locked On Clippers, he won $35 in 20 minutes. Seriously, it's a whole lot of fun. Play with friends or other fans and let your knowledge shine all the way to the bank. You can play without downloading anything. Just go to app dot quiz.com again that's quiz with three eyes and start playing today nba quiz is the ultimate knowledge challenge for fans that live and breathe basketball so go to app.quiz to test your knowledge and win cash today that's quiz with three eyes just like a three-pointer play now showcase your skills and take home cash prizes app.quiz.com where fans become champions all righty uh, we are back on Locked On Knicks. Um, before we get into your questions, I just I want I want to do a fun little thought exercise um, because it, I I got, I got to play in the realm of of pretend yesterday. And there's when when you lose something, this is trust me, this happens all the time. When you break up with someone, you tend to overemphasize their positive qualities, and you say, "Man, she was the best girl in the world. He was the best guy in the world." With Julius Randle the New York Knicks would have won an NBA championship. Um, and now that Julius is back, like I can, I can sink back into my realm of pessimism. Like, do you really think they're going to beat the Celtics? Like, yeah, we're going to stop Giannis in a series with Jalen Brunson. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, but is that wrong? Is that wrong? It might be. So who are the actual teams in the NBA? that have a better chance than the New York Knicks to go and win a championship this season. I'm going to say there are three teams out there that are no doubt about it. Even if the Knicks, let's just say they go and get Malcolm Brogdon. Let's just say they go and get DeJounte Murray. And, and, and all of this is with the caveat that I expect the Knicks, if Julius Randle is definitively 
going to be healthy the rest of the year. I do think they'll ultimately make a move for some bench help. Maybe even it's a lesser guy than that, but they're going to find someone that can boost their bench because they think they know that what's working in the regular season and is increasingly working better. I'm increasingly optimistic that, that maybe just maybe they don't have to make a move, but I think they're ultimately going to. So let's just say they do make that move. Who are the teams that are still just in a different weight class? I think there are three. I think the Boston Celtics are clearly the best team in the NBA, fully healthy with Chris Tapps Porzingis, with Drew Holiday, with Derek White, with Jalen Brown, with Jason Tatum. There's just no team with that type of talent. Um, and I think even more importantly, they are a really tough matchup for the New York Knicks. And I think Chris Stapps Porzingis is the ultimate X factor there. And if he's healthy, um, I think it's a long shot, even the way the Knicks are playing that they could beat the Celtics in a series. I would put fully healthy Knicks against fully healthy Celtics. I'd give the Knicks maybe a 10% chance in that series. I don't think it's impossible. I think the Knicks are, are that good. And that's how impressed I've been with them over the course of this run. But I, I just think the Chris Stapps Porzingis matchup is is horrific and even if you're starting isaiah hartenstein a guy who's a little bit more mobile um having a space floor for jason tatum and jalen brown and drew holiday and Derek white it, it is just too tricky to guard even with An og ananobi changing the equation somewhat for the Knicks. and maybe i'm wrong like it's, it's going to be exciting to get to see them play in a couple of weeks and and if the knicks maybe have a more of a window there than I'm giving them credit for. But I think the Celtics have, have proven themselves this year, like what they've lost and until that Clippers lost, like eight of their 10 losses, nine of their 10 losses. Like they could have won the game in the final minutes. They were up inside the final minutes. They, they have been a special team this year. Um, the Denver Nuggets are next. And I know, I know we just beat them by 40, but they are the defending champions. And Nikola Jokic is the best player in the world. And they've done it. They've been there. They've done it. They have to be in their own weight class until they are knocked off by someone else. And the third team I'd have in there may be a little bit surprising, but for those who watch, I don't think it will be. I think the Los Angeles Clippers are in there and that beating the Celtics at home by 20 points, even without KP kind of cemented that for me, that, that they are special. They are clicking. Um, I think Kawhi Leonard at full health is a top five player on the planet. And that might even be a little bit low. And to me, he is one of the few guys who you would say, e even Jalen Brunson playing at his apex, I think Kawhi is probably the best guy in that series. And at this point, like the list of those guys is probably on two hands and no more, but I'd put Kawhi in that category. And I just, I just think they're strong where the Knicks are still somewhat weak in, in that their strength is big wings. And you have someone to guard Kawhi Leonard now and OG Adenobi, but then you still have to guard. Paul George, you still have to guard James Harden. Um, and maybe that Knicks Clippers game is still sticking in my mind with, with, with obviously a very different Knicks team, but that, that group, their depth um, and their star power, um, I think are terrifying. And I think Ty Lu is frankly um, right after Eric Spolster for the best playoff coach in basketball. And I think if, if, if the Knicks face them, he would have a big advantage over Tom Thibodeau in a playoff series. Um, I say that, and I go into depth on that, to say, I don't think there's another team out there that I would say is clearly a favorite over the Knicks. And th that doesn't mean like, are right, you put a gun to my head or, or you offer me a million dollars if I have the right pick, would I pick other teams? I'd pick the Bucks over the Knicks. I'd pick the Sixers over the Knicks. I might still pick the Heat over the Knicks just because they're the boogeyman and they've made the NBA Finals two of the last three years. And the one year they didn't make it, they were, they were a shot, shot away. From making the finals or not to last year was their first year back. I guess two of the last two of the last four years they made the finals. They they were one shot away from making it two of the last four years. Um they are they're at a different level in the playoffs than what they show in their regular season. So I think I think the Heat still along that conversation. I think the Cavs, given how incredibly well they're playing, though they have very real questions about if this is replicable when they have Darius Garland and Evan Mobley. That sounds crazy like add two all stars back and get worse, but they're playing dramatically better since those guys have gotten injured. Um, and then the Phoenix Suns, just because their star power, I think, belong on the periphery of the conversation. But that is what a total on the Oklahoma City Thunder um, and the Minnesota Timberwolves are the two teams I'm forgetting in there um, out west. They are two teams that I would. Would I favor them over the Knicks? I would say I'd probably favor the Thunder slightly over the Knicks. I'd call it pretty 50 50 against the Timberwolves. Um, and maybe it'd be pretty 50 50 against the Thunder. I don't know. The point is, there are three teams that are 
head and shoulders, I think, above the New York Knicks. And maybe I'm underestimating just how much better they would be with a Malcolm Brogdon. But I think the way Josh Hart is playing right now, I think the way Quentin Grimes is playing right now, um, I think the way Precious Achua is clicking. I think the fact that we're all forgetting Mitchell Robinson, who was probably the team's best player over the first 15 games of the season, 10 games of the season. Um, he's coming back. He's coming back. All right. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to roll through some of your questions. That we have a lot of comments here. Um, first one comes from Paul, Paul, excuse me. I, you told me your last name on Twitter before I totally forgot how to pronounce it, but Paul Mayer, I think is what I'm going with. Um, thanks for the update, Gavin. Y'all always know this is one of the highlights of my day. Nick's for life. Shout out to you, Paul. I'm sorry. I totally forgot to respond to your last YouTube comment, but I really, really appreciate it. And, and uh, thank you so much for tuning in every day. It makes my day every time you comment. Uh, Josh Soto, underrated Nick's coverage from this channel. Thank you, Josh. Um, some tough matchups that Randall these coming weeks. Brunson has an opportunity to put the league on notice, cementing him as a 1A player. I got into it a little bit last night, but to me, that was... That was one of the tragedies of this Julius Randle news was that I I thought last night was Jalen Brunson, like even further cementing himself as a top 15 player in basketball in just torching a proud Heat team that came in having lost five games in a row and was desperate for a win on national television knows better than any other team in the league. I think has more respect for Jalen Brunson than any other team in the league. Um, has Terry Rozier to chase him around and bother him as Bam out of bio is a top three defensive player on planet earth is Jimmy Butler healthy rolling. And like anyone who watched that third quarter could tell Jimmy wanted this one badly and none of it freaking mattered. Jalen from three, um, just about every way possible inside the arc, torch this team, embarrass them, shame them, up fake after up fake, hook shots, spins, spins back, pivot, reverse pivot. Um, what what type of shots am I missing? Step back threes, assists where he drew four or five defenders, beating a defender with just pure strength. Like he just chucked Terry Rozier on a drive, uh, trucked him under the basket. He was majestic and he he has mastered the game of basketball offensively as a scorer I think there are still strides for him to make as a passer but 30 points eight assists no turnovers um another J Max stat but it's third time in Knicks history that's that's ever happened four of eight from three like it was it was a picture perfect performance and the guy is simply a killer and this offseason when I was making the case for them to go get Joel Embiid, it was predicated on the idea that in a playoff series, you need Embiid to be better than he's been. You don't need him to be much better than he's been because down the stretch of games, I don't know if Jalen Brunson is capable of being the quote unquote full-time best player on a championship team just because of his defensive limitations and the fact that he is a good playmaker, but he's not a LeBron level playmaker as a number one option or Nikola Jokic level playmaker as a number one option. And yet I think if you got Embiid to be that type of guy through three quarters, I think Jalen Brunson in terms of closing games, getting great shots and hitting hard clutch shots. Like I would, how many guys would you take over him? Maybe Luca, maybe Kawhi, Jokic, you have to take over him. Jimmy Butler, because of the playoff resume, you probably have to take over him. Is that the list right now? Maybe. It might be that short. Like, I, I think Jalen is that type of dude, and I think if the Knicks get one more big piece, that'll become readily apparent to those out there who are not watching this team night in and night out. And that was the cruelty of Julius Randle's injury, that Jalen, like, at his at his current apex, and maybe next year, the year after, there's still another level to go. I'm not I'm not saying it's over. Like I I got this I got this wrong the other day, so I'm gonna Google it right now. Jalen Brunson is 27 years old. He's, he's about 27 and a half right now. That is smack dab in the middle of his prime. This year, next year, the year after, maybe one or two more seasons if he follows the Steph Curry trajectory. Like you can't you get a player that good, 
you can't waste a single year. And that's not me advocating for the Knicks to be like, all right, sell the farm and and go get, I don't know, maybe is Mikhail Bridges like the best guy they could possibly get if they gave up literally everything this year. Um, that's not me advocating for that. I think if the Knicks think there is a a like ballpark chance at someone like Joel Embiid, you you make sure you don't make any move that sabotages that in the slightest. Um, the point of what I'm getting at is more so um, a Julius Randle injury would end any outside shot the Knicks had at a title this year. And Brunson has ascended to a point where every year is to some extent or another an all in season. Um, so thanks Josh for that comment. Um, Henry C said, thank God triple double Randall makes us a contender. Love that Henry Robert Harris. Good news. Uh, prayers that he heals. Well, totally agreed. Henry C it's good. It is so weird to watch games without Randall. Yeah. I'm just not, I'm not used to it. And we didn't, we didn't really get into it in terms of the starting lineup. Like I don't, I don't think I have original thoughts on that. It's pretty much the same as what everyone else said. Like, like what is, what is Tom Thibodeau doing a bind since he's had Josh Hart? He starts Josh Hart. It could be the point guard. That's out. It could be the shooting guard, small forward. Like I I'm borderline surprised. He did not try to play Josh Hart at center when Mitchell Robinson went out with that injury. Um, that is, that is the trust that Tom Thibodeau has in Josh Hart. So it's going to be Josh Hart. Um, and maybe this, this is a good opportunity. Um, Henry C., of uh, 15 games. I think because I said 15 games, but let's just look forward, right? Because obviously he does have the all-star break. So the average time missed, this is per uh, Jeff Stotts. I referenced it on, on our um, last podcast, but the average time missed with this type of injury um, with what he described as nondescript shoulder dislocation, which I don't know to be clear if that's an apt description for Julius Randle, I don't think anyone outside of Julius Randle, the Knicks and his medical team know that at this point, but let's just say optimistically it would fall into the category of nondescript uh, shoulder dislocations. Um, it is 31 days. So 31 days, I'm doing some fast math in my head, but I, th I think it brings us to about, I'm just going to call it a month, uh, February 29th. So if it's February 29th, um, it's nine games before the All-Star break. And then Philly, Boston, Detroit, New Orleans, and a theoretical return February 29th against the Golden State Warriors. So in that scenario, he would miss 14 games or 13 games. He would miss 13 games. Um, and if he doesn't make it back that game, he would miss 14 games and return March 3rd against the Cavs. Let's just say, um, here's the schedule. Charlotte, Utah, Indiana, the Lakers, the Grizzlies, Dallas, Indiana, Houston, Orlando, Philadelphia, Boston, Detroit, New Orleans. Um, so over those 14 games, I think I would have had the Knicks going 10 and four without Randall getting hurt. Um, with him getting hurt, I don't know. Maybe they go seven and seven. Maybe they go six and eight. Will this ultimately affect the Knicks' ability to have home court? Um, possibly. They're half game up on the Cavs. They are tied with the Sixers in terms of wins. They have two more losses than the Sixers. Like There's a world where the Knicks got all the way to the three seed, and that would be nice because you're probably probably getting the Pacers in the first round, um, but maybe you could look at it like this. You might be avoiding the Miami Heat in the first round, which I, I in some ways I do want that smoke. In some ways I don't want that smoke that early. Um, the good news is maybe you're lighting up for a four or five series with the Cavs, which are the road team, which I, I think if Mitchell Robinson is back, despite the Cavs improvements. And I, I do think Cleveland is substantially better between Max Struess and Sam Merrill. And for those of you who haven't um, heard of Sam Merrill, um, go to the ringer.com and check out Danny Chow's article on him or just Google some highlights. The guy is uh, is shooting like 40 percent from 30 feet plus and just routinely hits. Um, 30 feet plus three and is like Dante on crack, basically. Um, he's really good. The Cavs are better. They can challenge the Knicks in new ways. But the big if with Cleveland is if Evan Mobley and Jared Allen are healthy and they're playing like 30 minutes each a game, the Cavs are still going to have a lot of time where they have two non-shooters on the court. And if that's the case, the Knicks are going to beat the Cavs again. And it's going to be, I don't, I don't think it's going to be particularly hard. Even if Mitchell's better, even if Garland's better, um, I think I think the Knicks are just an incredible matchup for them, especially with the way Isaiah Hartenstein is playing and Mitchell Robinson, even even coming back at like not quite 100% and regaining his form, he's, he's going to be licking his chops for that series. So I say that to not to say the Randall injury doesn't matter. And, and the fear here is when you dislocate his shoulder, it's generally like even during the rehab process, it's, it's easier to like re- dislocated and if that happens like it might be concluded that he does ultimately need surgery so 
I, I don't want to frame any of this as like we're out of the woods or he's definitely going to be fine. Like I, I think the way Ian Begley, who is generally the, the single most plugged in guy on this team, um, phrased it is is ultimately accurate, right? Like it it is like we 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 don't know, but there is a lot of reason for cautious optimism. And if we do get that best case scenario that it's twelve to fifteen games, like I just it, I think it's the difference between being on the road for the first two games of the playoff series and being at home for the first two games of the playoff series. And that, that sucks. Um, the Knicks have been really great at home, obviously since this trade, but they can also win on the road. And I, I think as long as they, they, the, the bigger thing would be losing the possibility of getting to the three seed and being on the other side of the bracket from Boston until the conference finals. Just, again, you don't, you don't want to root for an injury and I'm not rooting for an injury, but just saying um, as objectively as possible in terms of the next chances, the best case scenario is if something happens to KP or something happens to Jason Tatum. Like that is, that is the next realistic path to getting to the NBA finals. Um, and and you, having to play Boston one round earlier, you just, you, you I think even the, the, the more uh, morally sound way to phrase this is, who knows, maybe like you get the three seed, maybe Joel Embiid averages 50 and 15 for a series and um, and the Sixers knock off the Celtics around before you get there. Maybe the Bucks fall to the four seed. Um, they don't adjust to Doc Rivers too quickly and they knock off the Celtics because Giannis and Dame go off. Um, maybe Miami gets the second round and they knock off the Celtics. Like um, you just want to avoid playing Boston as long as possible. And that's, that's where this potentially hurts you unless they fall all the way to the sixth seed. But again, if Julius isn't out for more than a month, I just, I, I don't see the Knicks falling that far. Um, they are, they're two and a half up on the Pacers. Let's just say Indiana makes up that ground and they're a half game ahead of the Knicks or even one or two games ahead of the Knicks. Like the way the Knicks have played post trade, um, I, I just think they'll be able to make up that deficit. And again, Indiana might be better than I think because we really haven't gotten to see Halliburton and Siakam play together for any substantial amount of time yet. So we'll, we'll throw a couple of um, asterisks on, on that notion. But point being, the, the biggest loss here is, is not being able to get away from the Celtics. And even that, like they're still, again, a game behind the Sixers. That wasn't, that wasn't definite even if Julius was healthy. All right, let's, let's rapid fire through some questions. Kim Jennings, think we should bring up Jacob Toppin and trade for Brogdon. We should be okay until Randall comes back. Um, they'll possibly bring up Jacob Toppin. To me, like he is not, I, I wouldn't be overly optimistic that he is ready to play NBA rotation minutes. And I think even if the Knicks bring him up, it would be if, if another big gets hurt. I think it's much more likely you see Jericho Sims um, playing some substantial time at back at power forward. We didn't all know how Tom Fivito likes that. And some of you at home may be groaning, but you should also remember that uh, when Tibbs went to that last year, um, the Knicks went on a big run and their defense uh, played like the best defense in basketball. And, and the backup unit is already playing so exceptionally well defensively um that could be really enticing obviously you're going to get a lot of minutes with the current backup group of um deuce grimes Hart, um og and precious but if there's more starting responsibility on both um heart and og i think tibbs will try to get to those minutes but he's going to have to split it with another lineup and that other lineup is probably going to feature jericho sims and it's probably never going to score but the other team's never going to score either and it's going to keep the knicks um, in some games. And yes, I do think they should absolutely trade for Malcolm Brogdon. And I've, I've made the case before and I'll continue to make the case. But what I love about Brogdon is that he is not only um, a superb option to lead the bench unit, and he's just going to offer you a lot more than Deuce McBride at this point in terms of shot creation. Um, he's also just as good of a spot up shooter as Deuce and he's six foot five and he will be closing games for the Knicks. And I think the idea of closing with Brunson, Brogdon, OG, Randall, Hartenstein. Uh, my concern against the best, best teams in the league is that the Knicks will just be outgunned from a talent perspective. Um, and we haven't seen this defense that's been so good tested by like many of the best offenses in the NBA. Obviously, they saw Denver and they passed that test with um, what's beyond flying colors, like colors that are like up in space, up in Uranus. Um, yeah, I'm well, I'm slowing down here. All right, we're gonna wrap this up soon. Um, point being, um, 
I, th I think they need a little more firepower. And I think Malcolm Brogdon would represent that. He's shooting over 50% this year on catch and shoot threes. And he would be getting a lot of open ones with Julius Randle and Jalen Brunson because that's just what those guys do. Um, yo from uh, Wake Up Already NYC. Yeah, he's that's a that's a that's a subtweet at me. Bring Jacob and see what's up. I'm with you. Um, we got Brunson, we'd be okay. I hope so. Um, or even Matisse Thibel for the cheap. He's an amazing defender. Um, I just don't, I, I honestly, I like the way Quentin Grimes is defending right now. I, I, if I always love Quentin Grimes. I admit it's a, it's a soft spot for me. It, it's probably, probably an area that I, I overlook stuff I shouldn't, but I think he, like if he attacks the rim and he defends the way he's defending, um, he needs to stay on this team. Um, let us use heart. For now, if anything, with OG on the court. Yep, for sure. Do you think Hardenstein can play the four? He's a good pass and get rebounds. Um, he can make 10 points a game and play Sims at center. I'm not in a starting lineup. Um, with a backup lineup, I could I could see them getting to that lineup and maybe rotating Precious in with the starters a little bit more. But I, I the only reason I don't see that happening is I think you're gonna want to match Hartenstein's minutes with an opposing center pretty one for one because as good as as precious is, like he's just gonna be undersized in in some matchups and same is true for Sims. So they did such a good job on Jokic. Maybe, maybe that's a thought I should give a little bit more credence to. Um, OG going to have to score 35 a game. That's the other thing that gives me some optimism that the Knicks can survive this stretch. If this had happened six games after the trade, I would have been quite pessimistic about it. Um, but OG has shown just more as a self-creator of late and like getting to that step back jumper with a ton of consistency um, and, and driving to the rim and, 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 and jamming or finishing with a Euro step lay, as we saw for the first time ever last time, like that, that was a sight for sore eyes. Like he is finding his confidence, um, creating shots and it's going to be put to the test because he's going to see a lot more defensive attention. And he's going to be getting a lot less open threes as long as Randall's out. Um, Dinesh Khan, um, this is going to be the final one I answer. Um, and then I'm going to wrap things up. Hey Gavin, how much does this hurt Randall's chances of making the all-star team? Um, well, he's, he's definitely, he's not going to be able to play in the all-star game unless, unless this is a miraculously light shoulder separation. So I, I, I wonder if he's, if the coaches are just not going to vote him in knowing that he's out or maybe they'll voting him in knowing that they'll get a mulligan, but he, he absolutely deserves to be an all-star. And if he doesn't make it because of this, it is an absolute shame. So that is a sad note to end what has been a very, very upbeat podcast, but thank you so much for tuning in midday. I know you guys all have lives and jobs and stuff going on. So I really appreciate this super fun to do. I'm going to try to do more of these um, midday live streams as the season goes along. So I really like being able to take your questions. Um, but until next time, um, which will be tonight um, after they play the Hornets, we'll have that up for you in the morning. I'm Gavin Shaw. We'll talk to you very, very soon on Locked on Knicks. 